This episode starts with a mystery at an elementary school in Beijing. A mystery about a garden. I remember there was one day when the, the students came and found out the plants were damaged. And then they saw that there are other kids, right? Because the, the school has other kids. That's the, our first location. So every kid, everybody said, okay, it must be them. They have destroyed it. And then our science teacher was like, okay, that's a very strong hypothesis. Why? Like, why do you think? So he turned that into such a beautiful science project. And then there are other kids saying, oh, yeah, maybe it's not the, the other kids. Maybe it's the cat. Okay, maybe there because there's wild cats who don't jump around. Okay, so if you think it's the cat, and then there are other kids saying, okay, maybe it's the, you know, they're playing basketball. There's a basketball field. It must be the basketball. They throw it to it. So what the teacher ended up doing is that, I said, okay, let's figure out this hypothesis, right? So like, you know, if it's a basketball, let's try it. If you hit the plant with different balls, what the plant looks like, then they actually did experiment. <laughs> and then ended up, they were saying, okay, it's not a ball. Like it's not from the ball. Like, you know, they were saying, okay, if it, is it from other kids? Well, other kids, you can go and ask them. And then they were saying like, you know, like, how do you, instead of going out and just blame them, like, how do you have that conversation, right? So like, that become an education thing. And then I think it ended up, they figure out, oh, they think it's probably the cat. <laughs> this is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton, and you just heard the voice of Inu Li, co-founder of E2 School in Beijing. And that science teacher she was talking about is typical of the teachers at E2. Project-based, innovative, and able to turn a potential crisis into a learning opportunity for everyone. And that's a good thing, because since it opened in 2016, E2 has experienced more than its share of crises. We'll get to that, but first, a bit about Inu. I was born in the late 70s in China, right? That's that's right after China's so-called opening up that happened in 1978. After my high school, I went to Tsinghua University, which is you know one of the top universities in China. I studied biology. And after I got my bachelor's degree, uh, I came to the States in 2000 to get my PhD in molecular biology at UCLA. And that finished in around 20, 2004 and 2005. And what do you remember about school, like before university? A lot of work, <laughs> hard work. <laughs> I think now putting in a kind of big education context, you know, there's a very, very distinctive so-called East Asian culture of working for the test, I would say. But actually, interestingly speaking, compared to today's education, you know, in China, our education is reasonably relaxed. While she was studying at UCLA, Inu met her husband, Hua Zhang, who was studying biology at Caltech. He left academia and joined an internet startup. After she got her PhD, Inu joined McKinsey, the management consultancy. That was in 2005. And in 2008, she moved back to China with her family. The family only stayed a few years before moving back to their home in Palo Alto, California. But during that time, something happened that would transform Inu's life. She enrolled her eldest kid in preschool. I think when he was two, two-ish, I was looking for a preschool. And that was this interesting preschool called um, Little Oak Tree. It doesn't sound very fancy, but it was founded by this uh, lady who, who was very remarkable. So she's probably like 10, 15 years older than me. And she was a PhD in anthropology from Yale University. And then she was working with, with the UN offices and all that. And from that point... She took this very unusual path, uh, I think around 2000, founded this preschool. And it's very unique. So it's, it's a very children-centered approach. And that's my first exposure to, okay, there are people trying to do the right type of education in China. And then that's why I think in 2014, so she was with this group. I think it used to be quite active in Northern California, SVP, Social Venture Partners. They were looking to fund grassroots education projects in California. So I joined a trip with her. So her name is Wang Gan. So I joined a trip with her in 2014 to visit some of the uh, SVP grantees. And that was very, very much eye-opening for me, understanding, okay, what educators are thinking about or doing and what kind of effort are being made on education equity here in the U.S. I still remember, so they visited quite a few charter schools, and also they visited this one school called um, Escuela Popular, so which is one of the schools in San Jose, I remember, basically uh, open for mostly, um, I guess, Mexican, quote unquote, illegal immigrants. So that school, uh, the way they're, they're being run, the way they kind of treat their students with dignity, 
and how successful they are, right, in sending some of their graduates to great universities and change their life was very, very impressive. I still remember visiting that school, but that was the, yeah, that was the trip we took in 2014. Then, in 2015, the Gates Foundation asked if Inu was interested in directing their China office. She said no. A few months later, the recruiter got back in touch and asked if she wanted to fly up to Seattle and meet Bill Gates. And she figured, why not? When they met, she asked him why he'd started the Gates Foundation, and he said it was because he realized there were huge global problems, such as malaria, that weren't getting investment because there was no money to be made by solving them. The conversation was more eye-opening than Inu had anticipated. You know, I was a pretty successful partner at McKinsey. I was being to different continents. You know, I traveled to Europe, to Japan, um, you know, to all those different places to serve my clients. I always fly business class, as you can imagine, right? So I had a, I had a reasonably successful business women life. <laughs> I was pretty arrogant. I thought I, I, was, I was like, I've seen the world, right? I've, I've seen it. But I realized, okay, what I've seen in the sort of McKinsey world was very much a, I would say, a upper middle class world, right? So that's the, where you, most of our clients are functioning in this, you know, market economy that functions in developed country. And what he described is a world I sort of know exists, but... I, I didn't know it's so massive, and I also didn't know there was organizations trying to, to do things about it. And of course, it's also connected with my research roots, like, you know, like my background from academic training. So yeah, I think that conversation would really play a role in, in thinking this very differently. So you took the job? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I decided to take the job. So, and then, of course, my husband was quite supportive. That's a big role because, because it is a step down for me financially <laughs> as a McKinsey partner, you know, the was reasonably lucrative, and it's hard to compare with the, the salary level there. So after discussing that, we decided we ended up moving back uh, in 2016. At this point, Inu and Hua Zhang had three kids, and the oldest was in kindergarten. In Beijing, he'd been going to Little Oak Preschool. Now he was part of the founding class at Alt School, a private so-called micro-school which had just opened up in Palo Alto. So the first year he was in Alt School, I was just very curious. Um, my husband as well, of course, because he also has a, a tech background. And then we were just, yeah, very open-minded. I was like, you know, I would just try it out for a year. And I think that one-year experience actually gave, you, gave me quite some uh, inspiration. Of course, later on, there are many stories that happened. But still, I was quite thankful. So I was, a, you know, the, the, the biggest sort of aha for me was like, okay, the, the school can be so different from the ones I have experienced. When Inu says that there are many stories that happened, what she's talking about is that Alt School, the company, a startup backed by the likes of Mark Zuckerberg and Peter Thiel, closed the Palo Alto School two years later, then gave up on the rest of its schools the year after that. Anyway, Inu's son had moved from a progressive preschool in Beijing to a radically personalized kindergarten in California. But with the family moving back to Beijing, there wasn't anywhere comparable where he could go to first grade. Frankly, if she, there is a good public school, a reasonable public school for my kids to go to, I would have been fine. But I realized that's not the case because uh, public school is becoming so stressful and anxiety driven. And then there is this quote unquote area of private schools. Um, but this private school has this big sense of, OK, we're educating for the elite. And then kids wear these fancy uniforms, uniforms. And so there's a very different value, I think, compared to what I was looking for. So I feel like, OK, there's either you go to this private school system that's trying to make your kids into those social elites, or you go to public school where this is so anxiety and stress driven. So you were concerned about the public school system. And then you said about the, the, the private school, really, that it felt like it was educating for the elite. Yeah. You were the elite. So why was that an issue for you? <laughs> That's right. No, that it was a good question. I actually also trying to kind of make peace with myself. Like, why am I so opposed to it? I think I was sort of a probably elite in the intellectual, intellectual sense, right? So I was a, from a very common family, like they were working class and they were, they were good. I mean, my parents were both college grads, you know, like, which is rare in their age, but it's not because they have family privilege. It was just, they were, you know, either working hard or there was like opportunities around that time. But I wasn't a sort of a social elite or economic or financial elite by any chance. So I think value-wise, I was very much a sort of a, a, a common person. So I think that is very strong in me. Okay, I need, I need to check definitions on financial elite, because you said you weren't a part of the financial elite doing this. Mm. 
in my kind of definition, a McKinsey partner who gets flown up to meet Bill Gates <laughs> is is within the financial elite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it is. You're right. I mean, like from that point of view,、uh, yes, yes, of course. If you look at income, when I was a, a McKinsey partner, I definitely has you know I'm belong belong to the you know I don't know what percentage, but definitely on the high end. You know, in terms of how much money I was making,、uh, but that I guess I I don't think that should be a reason that you should have entered this sort of country club life. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> so Inu decided to start a school. Well, not right away, but that's where she was headed. She'd already seen the alt school. Now she met one of the other superstars of 2010's education innovation. The other experience I had was a visit I paid to、uh, to Salman Khan, you know, on Khan Academy, because、uh, they started this Khan Lab school. That's when we started kind of having this idea. I was like, okay, maybe we could do something like this in Beijing as well, since we know we're moving. And the first person I talked to was actually Wang Gan, you know, the the one that runs the Little Oak、uh, Preschool, because you know she she's been thinking about this area for way longer than I did, right? So she's really paying attention to all these things. I was really checking with her first: is this a crazy idea? You know, if I want to do something like an all school or a collab school, basically meaning a small school, is it possible? And second, if it is possible. Do you have somebody you recommend who can run the school? Right, because I can't run it. <laughs> like, I need some sort of headmaster or somebody who has real teaching experience. So she was a big help. She basically said, "Yeah, why not?" Right. So she was encouraging me, like, and saying it's fine. Like, if you if you figure out some place you can establish something like this, and she connected us with Xiao Yue. So Xiao Yue was still today. She's our、uh, headmaster. And we chatted on the phone. I remember, and somehow we had this confidence. Yeah, we can do this. And this <laughs> so you're very early on in your new job at the Gates Foundation. Yeah. And you're talking about founding a school. Right. Were you going to do that in your spare time? What was the? <laughs> It might be naive now, but we felt it's easy. <laughs> I you know because I, I I look at what you know all school is what con life school was it's pretty simple to me at least around that time which is really naive I was like okay three rooms right five teachers that's not bad <laughs> that was really the sense of naivety and of course my my husband you know can 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 do this full time you know it's not like I'm going to do it but I was sort of the person thinking and waiting to write about it you know earlier we did an interview people were asking us. You know, if you knew what it is, would you have started? I was like, no, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have the courage, knowing what it really takes. But around that time, I think this whole kind of micro school concept was deceptively simple. Well, and in in COVID terms, you were basically thinking about starting a learning pod. Yeah, you can think about that that way. Yes. <laughs> That actually weirdly makes more sense. It's true because around that time, I think the inspiration was okay. You know, I think it was really a a big shock to me seeing how our school and Conlab school was starting. And they around that time, they got a lot of the press. You probably know that, right? So it was, you know, there 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 are interviews everywhere for them, and then they are simple. And if you look at the setup, both physically and um. Yeah, I think physically, it, you know, both in terms of hardware or real estate, it doesn't seem that difficult. And I had this sense of naivety. I was like, okay, you know, it's not hard for me to find three rooms in Beijing in such a big city. Like, of course, later on, turned out it's really hard. <laughs> But then I was simplifying the problem. I was like, okay, that's not bad, right? So, like, you know, I'll take the first step and see, you know, where it goes from there. That's kind of how we started. <laughs> so, how much of this was just inspired by? Your own anxiety about not being able to find a good school for your kid in Beijing. Oh yeah, that large part of it. There's one other thing I haven't mentioned about Inu. She was kind of internet famous, specifically WeChat famous. If you don't know WeChat, it's a Chinese messaging app that does basically everything. You can write posts, post pictures, text your friends, but you can also pay your bills, buy subway tickets, book doctor's appointments, and do your banking. And in 2014, while she was on maternity leave for her third child. Inu started a WeChat blog. This didn't come out of nowhere. She'd been getting requests for career advice for years, mostly from women. Then she got a phone call from a family friend who had a job interview coming up. She was paying some, I think, a consultancy for her job interview, and then they were giving her all this, in my mind, 
wrong advices on what kind of makeup you should be wearing, what kind of handbag you should be holding, and all that. So she was very confused, and then she was like, "Okay, I, you know." Through sort of a little bit of family connection, found me saying like you know I'm interviewing for this job. Is it is this how you should I should think about preparing for it? I think she's based in New York, or something like that. I was like no, <laughs> that's not true. And I realized because I have been interviewing and recruiting、uh, for McKinsey since 2002. So I realized okay, actually I have a lot of experience in this area, and I I've seen a lot of candidates out of school. Looking for a job and how they think about presenting themselves. So I started writing this sort of series. I think about five to six articles around like how you should prepare for a job interview. That's really how it started. That's the trigger. But then it turned out it it became much more massive because it kind of triggered a lot of McKinsey colleagues、um, to start sharing their experience, kind of misadvices they've received. During their career, and and became an interesting collection of things, and but that that's you know that series of interview articles was the starting point actually. You're going to notice that the next part of the interview has a musical accompaniment. That's one of Inu's kids practicing piano. Now back to the interview. So you start out with this series about interview advice. Yeah. And the numbers that you talk, I mean, the numbers that you were getting are pretty wild to me. Yeah, <laughs> as, as readership. <laughs> That's like, right. Were you ex- were you expecting that? Were you? How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. So we actually, I mean, it's not. We have never sort of managed it as a business or commercially, but now we have, I think, about one point two million subscribers. Yeah. So that was interesting. So like when we started, because that's when、um, we came back to the states. I was, you know, on my maternity leave. It was an interesting time. That's when、um, so Hua Zhang came back. Of course, we have young kids. He kind of basically stopped what he's doing、um, in Beijing then, and he started doing this full time. I mean, full time. I mean, like you know, that's that's when he he basically stopped、uh, working. He was, I think, he was the chief technology officer of one of the tech companies for a car for a startup、um, car service company、uh, because he was taking this leave. We were moving back to the states, so he also has time. So he he was. He really was the one that played a quite a cru- crucial role in in setting that up, right? So like he would he would be the editor of、um, receiving all these submissions and, <laughs> and and select the right articles and talk to the author and and edit and put it out. It's like a daily sort of yeah magazine, kind of probably like what you're doing now. <laughs> But that was the that was the twenty fourteen、uh, starting period, which 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 is quite、uh, even now I think about is quite crazy. Yeah. So when Inu and Wajang started thinking about founding a school, Inu wrote about it. I wrote an article saying that are you also stressed about you know education for your children? And then I kind of shared my observations of the the, the education availability in China and how I thought there were issues, and also a bit of a vision of what do I think a school should be. So there was a few sort of levels, right? One is I think on the Personal level, and you know, on the on the individual child level, I think the the right education should be one that respect their intrinsic motives, right? So it'd be really children centered. So that's at one level. And second vision, what we had is at the school level, right? So I think the school, I I did not like the fact that school was being advertised as almost a very narrow path, right? So if you want to go to some of the elite. Schools in China. This is the decision you have to make by the by the time your child is age three, because if you miss that stage, then you're going to you know miss step. You're going to not make it to the right primary school, not the right middle school, not right high school, and therefore you're doomed. So education is really marketed as a as a track rather than as a experience, right? So I was like, I think that was wrong. So but if that has to be a track, then can we have a different track? Can we have a track that kind of both. Taking what they can learn academically, but also respect them as as individual, right? So respect, you know, what whatever the the essence of education is, and thinking, can we have a different track? Basically, that's kind of what I'm asking. And then the third one, I was saying, what I felt was missing in education in China is that it is being used as almost this exclusive tool, but rather education is again is a is a life experience, right? So not only for your children, but also for the parents. And eventually, every education is local. You need to have a community, right? But but in the way that's the mainstream education, the way it's being done, it almost like 
you know, the schools are sort sort of a consumer product, right? So your parents come here and pay the money or or pay go public school, and you buy the service, and then the service promise certain future for your children. Because that's that's wrong, right? So education is something is actually should be quite inclusive and open. It should be a sense of community in there. And how do you then support the adults in that system? How do you support teachers? Because it was interesting. That's around the time when I see this survey, basically serving teachers in China. Like how it was a very interesting question. They were asking how um how likely uh you're going to have your children be a teacher again. And then the answer is like ninety percent of them said no. Like they they don't. You know they don't like what they're doing, and then they they want their they want their children to do something else. I think it's only like very single digits saying yes, which is very concerning, right? So I said, you know, if you don't have happy teachers, how can you have good education? This is just a lot of fantasy and thinking that you have you know somebody who have a big degree and in front of your child and your child can be good. They have to be fulfilled individuals and professionals. And how do you support that? And how do you kind of include parents as part of the community as well? And parents need to be. Lifelong learners themselves to support, you know, to be to to be best supportive of their children. So that's the third level. So so sort of kind of outlined a little bit of our thinking what a school ought to be. Yeah. So that kind of in essence is the a bit of the vision of what it is, and that um that was the article that got put out. So when you wrote that, what kind of response were you anticipating? Frankly, I was very nervous.、Uh, I didn't know.、Um, I was a nobody in education, right? So I yes, I do have followership on my account, but I have zero. Credibility <laughs> education. The first title I that I put on the article is that you know I want to do an experiment. I was saying I don't really know, but this is what I thought. And then around the time, the reason we put it out was because in order to do it, we need to figure out a starting point, right? So I think that was probably like in February or something when I when I flew back to China, you know, again because I took this job in summer of twenty fifteen. So like I I flew back for the job. And then one of the trips, it was interesting. We, I had this thought for a while, and then one of the person I know was introducing me to this public school. And this public school was basically they only they were freshly kind of taking up a campus, which is which wasn't their campus, but they were taking up, and the campus wasn't doing very well. They, they, there's not a lot of students. It's a kind of poorly performing public school, and then the principal was pretty progressive. So somebody talked about this idea. And she's open to it, and she said she's she's willing to give like three classrooms of her newly adopted public school. Now I look back, everything seems a bit of miraculous because that public school also has a license for a private school, so we had that ready. So that's why that was also a trigger for me to to, to put this article article out. I said, you know, not only this is a thought, but we actually have a location. We actually have a proper license to start a meeting. Why would they just have a private school license? The reason is that some of the public schools,、um, public school budget is tightly managed, as you can imagine, right? Because it's public money and everything. But those thoughtful educators wanted to have budget to do other things. And what is the way to get the financials to work? Is usually for them to do some business. Okay, and business can be many things. It, it can be many forms. They could do training. And they're not really trying to make rich themselves, but like usually the money from those businesses can come in and support some of the extra things the public school want to do. So there was a period where public schools can have license for private arms, like you could have an arm for private school、um, that's kind of managed by you. But because it's a private school, you could charge a tuition, you could have all kind of different financials, and that financial can give you a bit of a leeway. This kind of falls in your lap of like, oh, there's this school. Not only do they have three rooms you can use, yeah, but they have they already have the private school license. It was kind of magical, indeed. It just happened. Okay, that was a school who wanted to do something and have a license. Like, so like it was kind of godsend. So around the time, I was like, okay, wonderful. So I was, I'm still very grateful. If that didn't exist, I would have never started. <laughs> they just happened to be there around that time, only for a year, and later on they kicked us out. But still, we started. <laughs> So where was the money coming from for you? I had, yeah, because although I was at McKinsey and everything, right? So, but basically, because I wasn't like doing like investment or big equity, so it was it was really just our savings, and it's not enough to get started. So Hada and I, we had, you know, that's maybe I think that's when our account was three hundred thousand followers or whatever. So like there are people there, and we had this idea. We said we're going to start this online learning community. Okay. And this community, 
I don't, frankly, I don't know what I'm going to teach you, but so because there are people who are following my writing, as this community, we're going to be, we call it lifelong learning community. Okay, I'm going to come up with something. And the community has a membership fee. And then the membership fee is 2000 RMB per person, which is like $300 for a year. Okay. And that's when, just so you have the context, when this kind of concept is becoming very hot, right? people were saying, okay, they're, they're learning stuff on apps. They are getting, so like their, their companies start doing these things in China. And we just have this followership, which we have never sort of like sort of commercialized. So we said, we're going to do that. And I was pretty straightforward. I said, we're doing the school and then the money is going to get us started for the school. And again, we had no idea how successful it would be. We said we're going to open it for a thousand members. And to our surprise, it got filled. Like the first thousand went out in 24 hours. So we, we basically, I was sold. Um, and Why do you think people paid for it? <laughs> well, people like me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. I think two, yeah, two reasons. One is... Yes, I do. Around that time, you know, we have a followership for like close to two years. There are people who really follow us and then, you know, like what I put out. Um, 70% of my followers are women. Okay, so those are career women who are, you know, who just find sort of resonance in what I write. And of course, I also talked about, you know, this this money is going to help us start a school. I think there are also people who okay, want to be inspired by the but the education concept and idea wanted just to be part of it. And then it, it, you basically give them a reason to give you some money. And as I were I saying, we're not raising the money, but we're just selling this product. That online community now has about 16,000 members who are chatting, taking part in forums, and attending online classes. But let's get back to that article Inu wrote about starting a school. Once my article came out, of course, it went viral. So like in one day, we have 200,000 reads. People are all talking about it. Everybody reached out. So towards the end of the article, I, we only left an email address. I said, you know, we're going to start. So if you are interested in getting your kids into our school, this is how you, you apply. If you're interested in becoming a teacher, this is the email. And like in two days, we got 800 emails. I, I still, I can't believe it. I got 800 emails. We get like Hundreds of teachers applying to come here and then like hundreds of families wanted to go. So that's how we get started. Well, they all hated their jobs. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why when I say this is uh, something we want to put teachers. And I still think it was, was pretty visionary, you know, even like looking back now. I said, I want sort of a three concentric circle. I said, that's what I thought that's what a good school should be. I said, you know, the children, child is, the, is, is at the center of the classroom. And second is that I think teachers should be at the center of a school, right? Because if you don't have happy teachers, you don't have anything. And third, the, te- the school should be at the center of a community. I said only when you have this three center aligned, it's a good little ecosystem that can function. So that's why I think that's very inspiring to many teachers. So we, we got way more, to be frank, parents are more anxious because the summers are all, you know, is this reliable? How about like, because everybody's being brainwashed on this track concept of education. Like what track is this? So parents are skeptical, but, but teachers, oh my God, like there's so many teachers writing emails to us and with CVs and everything. And then Xiao Yue, our head of school, was really put to be in charge of lots of operations. So I continue writing because of my first article, I became somebody known in education space from somebody who's a completely outsider. But then, then I was invited to give speeches in different education conferences and all that. So like, that's still part of my, my role. So I, I, I talk about it, I write, but I don't kind of hands on. In, so I don't in, in, engage in hiring and all that. But my husband is full time. So my husband is the CEO now. And then um, he's been CEO from the beginning and also our head of school. So that has been the kind of a full time team. But he also doesn't have any education experience. He doesn't, exactly. So that's why originally he started with this most of the IT side. So you had this personal investment that your kid was going. Yeah. What were you thinking when you sent your kid in for that first day of school? Oh, <laughs> I was so excited. You know, I, I, I was very excited. I think it was, yeah, sort of a dream come true type of thing. Because when we had this article was in March... And school opened in September, right? So it was like 170 days. We counted. It's 170 days from the day we decided to do it until the school was opening. I was like, wow. Like, although you know you're doing it, you still don't believe it's <laughs> it's coming true. Do you remember what that first day was like? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> 
So usually in China, the first day of school is September 1st. And, you know, we didn't really have the permission to have any ceremony in the public school ground. So we were trying to be creative. So we actually went to the Forbidden City, which is the Palace Museum. And we just bought tickets. So we basically had the first sort of opening day ceremony there. So Forbidden City was basically the, the palace complex of the old emperors. It's now a, a touristy thing. But there was this building, which is used to be the library for the palace. So we basically designed a route for different teams to go around the palace and then landed in the courtyard in front of the library. And then that's where we had a few sort of speech and then have, have a few interactions and pretty short, because again, at the end of the day, this is a public space. It's not, a, you know, we, we can't carve out any privacy for a private event. But nevertheless, you know, that's kind of the point of it, is that how do you appreciate, you know, part of your surroundings and getting your experience as part of that uh, context. So it was like a scavenger hunt the kids were doing? What, what were they doing, taking them around? It's the equivalent of that, right? Yeah. So we had a little booklet that the teachers designed for the kids. Everybody has a, a little thing. They, they go, yeah, check different places. And then that actually has stayed on as a tradition. So even like this year, so basically every year we do that. Of course, now we have a lot more students with parents. It's becoming quite an interesting day because if, let's say, if we have like, let's say 400 students with their parents and we're talking about 1,200 people, right? <laughs> And then we ended up designing different routes and split into different days. But that has been what, you know, we hold as a tradition for the first day of school, or really because of the constraint of the venue that started in the first year. So every every year you start in the Forbidden City? Yeah, now we do this every year. Yeah, and then, but, you know, because it's so big, right? So this is sort of the biggest palace complex, so there is no way you can do the whole thing. So we, you know, now... It's like a half day event. And usually the, the teachers would go like a couple of times before just to map out what route we're going to take. Um, and different uh, grades then have different themes, right? So for example, for a higher grade, they can understand more. And then their topic can be, you know, what is the water system like in the palace? Like, you know, because usually those are things you don't pay attention to when you just go there to visit and take pictures. So like things like that. And also what are some of the doors? Like that will be theme around doors, different type of doors and gates. And why is it designed so? And also there are all kinds of different things related to their life, you know, because that, that that was built. Now it's like, I think last year was 600 years of anniversary. So that was, you know, how do they do heating during winter? Because it's super cold in Beijing. So you sort of, you present each grade with a mystery to solve. In indeed. Yeah, that's a good way to say. Exactly. And this year was even more fun. We have parents kind of playing the, you know, they dress up as, you know, people from that time. And, you know, that would be a little quiz they will, you know, give to the students. And the students would actually have a, a presentation sort of in front of them. And after they're back, it was integrated into our math class and Chinese class or language class as well. And saying they're going to make a little small presentation of what happened. What did they see? And why is that? What was the significance of choosing the Forbidden City? Why did you want that to be your launch? It was interesting because it was in Beijing, right? And then, you know, if you ask, you know, what is the most famous landmark, you know, would be the Forbidden City. But how much do you really know about it? Like, I certainly didn't know much. <laughs> so I think that was part of the inspiration. Like, can we choose something that's in the city? And, you know, you think you know, but you really don't know. <laughs> and use that as well. I think that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, is, is really picking somewhere public. And part of it is, is kind of breaking down the school walls, right? Is to have real life experience. So, you know, like we wanted to do something that's outside of the school and you can do something that's, that's kind of connected to a, a meaningful, a significant sort of landmark of the city. You know, it was interesting in my, in my sort of corporate life, like, you know, when I was at McKinsey and all that. And I know there will be companies and corporates that rents uh, spaces in Forbidden City for private events. And, you know, from my other side of my life, I know that's true, but, you know, you have to be, be able to pay. <laughs> but then we were like, you know, we, we, we don't for the school, but we can buy tickets, right? Tickets is pretty affordable. So that, that kind of part ex excites us because usually people think about you have an event in the Forbidden City. That means you somehow is, you know, financially well equipped, <laughs> right? People think that's kind of fancy. That's that, that type of event. But, you know, there was this contrast 
we have. I was like, you know, we, we'll just buy tickets. We'll just go. Anyway, so that was part of the, I guess that's the main intention to, to make it a familiar, but actually foreign <laughs> environment and make it a public sort of space and take place in a public space and kind of marry that with, with what we want to do in education. That's so cool. So you have this, this really fun launch. You've got this powerful metaphor of taking something familiar and looking more deeply at it as just a pretty, that's a pretty potent metaphor for education generally. Mm -hmm. And then you're rolling, you have, what did you say 31 students the first year? Yeah. So you have, you have 31 students, you have these three classrooms, everything's great. When did you find out you had to move? Yeah, I think we found out basically towards the end of the first year. And actually, it was pretty abrupt because they're saying that, you know, during the summer, you have to move out. <laughs> Why was that? Why did you have to move? I mean, the official reason is that this is a public school ground, right? Uh, although we pay rent, there's a contract, uh, but it is basically deemed not okay. And then this is a very gray area, you know, like when they decide it's okay, it's okay. When they decide it's not okay, it's not okay. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because I remember so, you telling me, I remember you telling me that it was not that uncommon a thing for a public school to have a private school license because then they could use the tuition to get other supplies. Basically, in this particular case, they used to have two licenses. They still have. But then when they got the license, it was okay. I don't know what happened around that time. That was a policy window. It was okay. And then they were looking at it because there are so many public schools who are making so much money from this and became, and, then, and basically stashed away in their own bank account. They call it the little gold mine or whatever. There wasn't even a name for it. And then, then of course, there is this discipline or whatever came down and saying that's not okay anymore. So basically, we were able to ride that gap when they had that license, they can use it. But then it turned out that it became not okay. So we have to move. I remember they told us probably in spring. Yeah, in spring. And I remember we were basically, you know, frantically looking for alternatives, you know, for the next year. So what did you do? Well, well there are two things we do. Well, first of all, we, co we continue to negotiate. So, you know, we actually did agree for a longer time. Can we at least keep part of the classroom? Because originally the plan was to, you know, the second year we have more students, right? Sure. Basically, they were able to, I think, keep the three classrooms for us for one more year. But then wh whoever the new recruits we have, we have no more space for it. So the school is close to this park called Chaoyang Park. And then the, the park has a sort of a children's activity center. And one of the center is a Lego store, you know, rented that center. So they have they have Lego classes and then they have a few classrooms upstairs and was not, you know, widely used. So we were just being creative. We negotiate with that Lego store and saying, can we use the, the rooms upstairs? And that was our first move. So basically the, the younger kids who were recruited ended up being in that park. And then in the in parallel, we, of course, continue looking for places where we can move everybody to, right? Because that's not, you know, an ideal solution. So I think we, we ended up renting a, a building, which used to be, I don't even know how to translate it, you know, it used to be a boiler room. <laughs> so so in, Beijing was in winter, it was heated by, you know, they call it kind of central heating. Basically, the city has this, you know, each area has this big boiler. And then the boiler get into every household was connected with this um, heating device, which is basically by uh, steam. And then so the, the boiler was, you know, burning coal and heat up water and get into the central pipes and go into the city. So that was a deserted, used to be a state-owned factory. So the factory had this kind of boiler building because it's a building they converted into a three-story building because the boiler used to be super big. You know, we calculated can probably host like a 100 students or 150 if we kind of do the design. So that became our, you know, we rented it. Basically, that was a pretty bare building with a, with a yard. And then we ended up hiring a designer's I really looked at how do we convert that into a uh, a mini school building. So it you know become a very creative project. It's 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 very nice. I'll, I'll show you pictures so you can see. It's very children friendly. We designed all those little features with a slide inside, you know, with little holes where only children can go to, where that become a little kind of a book nook for reading corners. Anyway, so it was was really good, and we were there for I think probably a year and a half, maybe towards the end of twenty nineteen, I think. And then it was interesting because we were getting attention, right? Because, you know, I write and people know we're doing this. So the, the, the Beijing sort of education authority came to check us out. 
And then, of course, on the education side and on the design, they were quite complimentary, saying, OK, this is great. Was, you know, we were very proud. It was good times. But then, because the education authority came, right, according to the whatever school building standards, this doesn't comply. And then it's not because we are sort of breaking the law, because it's almost impossible to comply with the standard. You know, the standard was was made in such an impractical way. So everybody was trying to get around. But because, you know, they came, so they have to say, we came and we checked on your facility, you don't comply. <laughs> and then they gave us a notice and saying, you know, you have to move. <laughs> and and that was it. I was like, wow. And then, the, of course, they were kind of tra- trying to be helpful as well. There was this school who they're basically not running well. They're losing students, but they have a facility. So they have the right license. But that license was 10, 10, like 30 years ago. So their, their, their building is pretty run down. It's much worse than what we have. But ironically, that that's okay. <laughs> because back then, they have checked the boxes and nobody bothered to check them again. So, you know, there are many kind of laughable things like this. I was like, wow, because so this is fine and ours isn't. But anyway, it was fine according. So like they were saying, okay, maybe that's one way for you guys to work this out. So I think at the beginning of 2019, we moved to that school. So we had signed a contract with them, sort of renting their space because they have plenty of space that, you know, they're losing students. And then after that, because then they had so much debt, which we didn't know, right? Because the school has been losing money for a long time. And one of the condition is for us to help sustain their cost as well. Meaning they have students, they have teachers um, so continue doing that, but ended up, you know, because there's so much unrevealed that debt when they signed this with us, you know, we just realized, you know, there was a big, you know, a big scam. <laughs> right. So I think in beginning, beginning of 2020, yeah, last year, we started looking for another place. And then there was a, another school they have moved and then they have a space. So this is where E2 now. And then we, we ended up, you know, kind of taking up the lease and do this all almost all over again, kind of renovating the school. Um, of course, we kind of make it, you know, as you're doing education, we make every move a education opportunity. <laughs> so like, I remember every time we move to a new place, we'll have a project, you know, like for two weeks for the kids to learn about the new place, you know, to draw a map of where this is, what's inside the campus, what's around us. And then, one of because we and we have to have like you know school buses because they're 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 kids coming from from different places to our school, and then I think one of the projects for our um, uh, middle schoolers this year or starting last year is how do you design a a bus route right so like you know that's actually a pretty compli- complex complex math problem, um and how do you sort of make that you know knowing where the school is where different people live. And um, how do you map out a route? So, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can, kind of turning everything into a educational opportunity. <laughs> I want to end with something Inu said to me about what's kept the school and kept her going despite all these setbacks. People see the infrastructure, see the whatever curriculum, but that's not what makes good education happen. What makes people ed- education happen is, is a group of adults that kind of oscillate on the same frequency. And that's how we survived all these moves. <laughs> we could have easily died, like in any, and we're like, it's 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 costly. Like we we're still not making money now. Like it's not like we're making money. Every time we ended up, you know, there there, there are different things that happened, but you kind of keep going. So I guess the deep down is how do you kind of continue to to build this community, this this virtual community almost of people who who think and believe the same. And I think that's that's the ultimate goal. I think the visible part is only just like the I, the tip of the iceberg. It's really all below. Just like that's why I think High Tai High was, was doing. I can totally appreciate and understand what you are doing because that's exactly what kind of keeps the visible part going is the invisible part. High Tech High Unboxed is hosted and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. You can find photos from E2 school in the show notes. And let me tell you, there is a lot more to discuss about E2. I haven't talked about the campus they opened in Guangzhou, a city in China that, according to Google Maps, is a 21-hour drive from Beijing and it's still going strong. I also didn't even mention the app they designed for the school, which teachers use to both design projects and write reflections every week. The school took some of the stories collected in that app and published a book. It won a national award. I mean, of course it did. 
Nothing about this story surprises me anymore. Huge thanks to Inu Lee for telling me about it, and thanks to you for listening.